Those are lovely uh, as a Predator logo. This was uh, uh, designed by James Bills. Um, he's done uh, special effects stuff for me uh, on almost every movie I've done. Um, oh, I'm Jason Horton, by the way. I uh, wrote and directed it. I'm Mel Gomez. I'm executive producer on Monsters in the Woods. Executive producer, like AD, uh, <laughs> PA. Mainly PA. Grip. Mainly PA. <laughs> so. <laughs> Monsters in the Woods. This is a, this is like the very definition of a micro budget film. I mean, we, you know, uh, produced it on our own, made it on our own. There's you know no studio, no deep pockets. You know, we were just out there like, you know, doing it ourselves. In fact, there were no pockets, and the pockets weren't involved in any of this. Uh, this is actually one of my favorite scenes. To be honest with you. Uh, yeah, I I wanted. I mean. For the movie within a movie, like, you know, I wanted it to just be this really cheap, like, bad horror flick. You know, I wanted it to look almost like a cheap porn playing a bad horror flick. And so that, that's what I was going for. So as part of the, the story, though, when you say you wanted this to go to be part of a cheap horror flick, what, what is the basic element of this story, though, in well, terms of why this scene? Oh, well, I mean, basically, the director, you know, he had made this drama this indie drama that he was really proud of and just he couldn't sell it like distributor after distributor they would not pick it up they told him it didn't have enough violence it didn't have enough sex so he's like fuck it i'm gonna make a movie and it's gonna have so much sex and so much violence they'll be choking on the blood and titties so that that's what he says that's not my line <laughs> so so this is our scene with the uh, blood and titties coming up here yeah pretty much and I had, this is actually, I mean, I've shot nudity before, but this was the first time I've actually done a sex scene, Yeah. you know, it, for, for, you know, what it was. So it was a little uncomfortable. The actors were both really cool with it, though. They kept things loose. They were light. They wasn't too tense. It was, we, and, and we were in and out, no pun intended, very fast. Now, this is um, Jackie Holland. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who, uh, Jackie, <clears throat> when we were first casting, I noticed she does a lot of comedy. Uh, she, in fact, she does a tremendous amount of comedy. Yeah. It's actually very funny. Um, but in this, when we cast her, I, I always thought it was a great choice in the sense that uh, she had that that feel of a woman who's been through this one too many times being cast this way. Oh, like as, a, as the, the, the pretty girl, like, you know, naked girl, maybe, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and really her, her comic timing like really comes out too especially uh, when we get into the latter scenes when we're in the you know in reality you know and she, 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 she she's good this is uh, that is uh, Richie Rad playing turkey neck <laughs> uh, originally uh, uh, it was going to be our uh, uh, one of our other producers uh, Robert Bravo he actually designed the turkey neck uh, mask and uh, he had wore it. We'd actually done a earlier shoot, like a test shoot, and uh, he wore it, and we did all that, and he was really proud of himself doing it. But when it came here, I, I forget why he didn't do it. He was, I guess he was busy producing. Did you ever have a title for this opening movie, like Revenge of the Turkey Neck or anything? I, you know, I honestly don't remember. <laughs> At one point, we were going to shoot a fake trailer, a longer fake trailer with, like, the characters, mm -hmm. like, you know, like, uh, Eddie, who we were going to introduce in a minute, or who just got killed, and her, and they were going to be walking around the woods, and, you know, like, hey, did you hear that? And they come across some old man, and he's like, you don't want to go in those woods, there's the turkey neck in there, you know, stuff like that. And this was originally supposed to be all one shot. As the camera's panning uh, left here, it was supposed to continue the pan around to the girl on the tree and then back around to them and then back around to her. The entire scene would have been in that one shot. Like, I really wanted to strongly differentiate the, you know, the fake bad movie and then come in with a fairly stylistic, like, like good, you know, good movie. Mm -hmm. You know, and we came out with some, you know, our coverage here is fine, but uh, unfortunately... Uh, the actress we had to shoot her separately in Malibu and she couldn't be with us in Big Bear with Glenn so we had to break it up in coverage by the way I thought you did a great job um, matching this up oh no, yeah. no one has ever told me they couldn't tell the difference between Big Bear and Malibu whenever whenever you did things like this it was just actually very well done Oh, thank you. Oh, well, one one thing I did uh, in color correction to kind of help everything, I uh, after I got a fairly even match, is I added this uh, green tint throughout the movie. 
you know, and I was also kind of, you know, I, I wanted to have a different look. Most in the, most of the times in the movies, it'll be super saturated. Um, you know, the colors will pop. It, but I, I, I wanted the... Uh, I wanted it to be a little bit more desaturated, mm -hmm. and I, I thought the green had a, like a sickly quality to it that I yeah. liked, kind of eerie, and it's just it just looked different to me. Mm -hmm. And Looks then uh, uh, the other uh, major thing you'll notice, and you know, because we shot mostly in broad daylight, and there's a lot of uh, what they call blowout, you know, where your whites are going really bright or the sky looks kind of white. Uh -huh. And I knew this would be an issue shooting outside, you know, all the time, and you know, we didn't have the the you know the time or the money to be out there flagging and. You know, cutting off the sun, cutting mm -hmm. off the shadow. So I used it as part of the look. You know, and the the movie becomes this like kind of bleached out, like almost apocalyptic looking, you know, mm -hmm. wilderness. And that's uh, uh, Glenn Plummer. Um, Glenn came in and uh, worked with us just for a couple of days. Um, he was actually only scheduled for one, but uh, uh, we ran behind on that day. It was you know first day of typical problems, and he actually. Uh, uh, offered to stay the next day for nothing and we finished him out it was really cool working with him and he did a great job for uh, the amount of time that he had goes to show you his, his capabilities his professionalism oh, yeah. uh, I, th I thought he brought a lot to this character is actually a, an interesting character since, yeah. since some of these are actually based on real people right I mean ba based on an aspect uh, of myself yeah yeah uh, I mean, uh, there was some kind of mix up. Uh, one of the, the other producers didn't actually. He actually got the script late. It was uh -huh. like the night before. So like he was literally like he like would memor step aside, like memorize the lines for three or four minutes, and then come back and just nail it. You know, I, I, w I was actually re like really super impressed. And that's uh, Lee Perkins there in the red. I worked with Lee a little bit on Edges of Darkness. Um, here's a really good example of an actor coming in with a part that's, I mean, honestly, in the script, the part, the uh, boom operator was a little two-dimensional, and he came in and just created this, like, fully formed, living, breathing character, the whole super dude thing, that's all him, the glasses, the, the only thing I picked was the outfit, but yeah, he totally came in and it just, like, totally made that character, it's one of everybody's favorite characters now. And that was, uh, oh, that's uh, Blaine Cade there with the hat. Um, Blaine's worked on every single movie I've ever done. Uh, he's usually my production designer. Um, I always knew he had it in him to like get in front of the camera and do stuff. Well, I was going to ask you that. I mean, after all this time, I know, I know you've done some smaller things with him, but this was a pretty major role of, a, of your antagonist in the movie. Uh -huh. and, and you pick, I know you know him well, but... Um, what what do you think was the one reason why you picked him to do this role when it came down to it? Blaine was just perfect for this role. I mean, you had a character here who's you know slightly awkward, comes off slightly timid, um, a little funny, you know, a little off. But uh, beneath it, like he has this like seething like like anger, you know, or rage almost. And like if you know Blaine, if you know Blaine well, Blaine. Blaine, Blaine can get really, really mad. I, I actually saw that when I didn't feed him on time. He had a little bit of that in him, but he, he truly, really, really came off well in yeah. this character. I was, since I've never seen him perform, nor did I know that he performed, uh, he just blew me away. I thought he did a fantastic yeah. job. You know? it, was, it was, I mean, I gotta admit, I, I was a little bit scared coming into it, a little bit apprehensive, because I, I was, I had doubts as to whether he would be able to access the parts of his personality that are so right for the character, you know, and, and Blaine, you know, he's done some acting, but not a lot, so, you know, the, wasn't sure if the technique was going to be there, but, I mean, he, he was great. And on top of that, taking on such a major role. What else did he do in this movie? Uh, he also did it, our production design. Now, when we're out in the woods, there wasn't a lot of production design in the zoo, but he also, like, uh, he designed and helped build the entire uh, cave set, which was actually on his property. And, I mean, for a movie of this size, too, having a cave that size, like a cave set that, I mean, it was it was decent size. I mean, it was, it was, it was about the same size as a, you know, a medium-sized apartment. I mean, it was, it was good. I mean, we had the, uh, you know, two rooms, uh, corridors, I mean, it was fantastic. Yeah. And he did it all in like less than a week. Well, I know we're starting to sound like the uh, the Blaine Kate fan. Yeah, I know. There, but, uh, we're just going to talk about Blaine. But, but I still owe, owe Blaine 20 bucks. So I thought I'd, you know, 
I, I think I probably owe him a little more than that. <laughs> In all, in all reality, did a oh. great job. Now, this is Edward Hendershot. Yeah. Uh, who plays the, the role of Bert in, in the movie. Uh, tell us a little bit about this, this character as you, as you envisioned it when, when you were first writing this. I mean, it, like, uh, the, the movie didn't exactly come to me linear, linearly, uh -huh. but uh, I, I, knew, I knew I was going to have the very beginning, and I knew I really wanted to askew a lot of horror cliches throughout so I knew I wanted to kill the black guy off first. Or at least make it look like I killed the black guy off first, but we really hadn't, you know, because he, he comes back in in the second act. Right, right. You know, but so, the, like, so that just came to me. And then um, the, the kind of pseudo action hero thing with him, though, that came more, I, I guess in my first uh, conception of the script, he actually was a little bit more of a legitimate action hero uh -huh. but then as I'm writing the script I actually kind of discovered that he wasn't really an action hero he was an actor playing an action hero like right. I think that's the secret to him like there's there's a scene later on when he's in the cave and uh, he's complaining about his manicure and you know he's you know he's acting kind of babyish and like I think that's the real him right. you know and then he takes a minute and composes himself and he's like I'm an actor you know and he's, then he goes on and he plays the action hero and he does end up being like kind of badass but right. But it, but he's he's playing badass, you know. He isn't necessarily badass, and I, I think Ed, Eddie encompasses that. Like yeah. he was really good. Like he's he's very like he's outgoing. Yeah, you know, but he's a Hollywood guy. He's you know he's an actor, and he's he's playing. You know. Right. Uh, and and I think uh, in a lot of ways, uh, uh, Claudia's character is like a flip of that. Of that. Yeah. You know? Like the the other side of it. Which we'll we'll get to Claudia when we see her here. Right. Yeah. Um, Oh, and we just uh, we actually just passed uh, uh, Linda Bella too. That was uh, like her first scene in there, and uh, Linda was probably the scariest casting that I've ever done. <laughs> like, it, I mean, no, no, I mean, don't get, that sounds bad, but I, I mean, I absolutely yeah, love her. Yeah, explain but that. Uh, it was um the the part was uh, envisioned much differently. Uh -huh. Like uh, the character was a little bit more dour. She was supposed to have been a cutter, someone that cut themselves, and right. you know she was going to be like the almost a. Al almost a cliche like goth type girl mm -hmm. and uh, I'm, I'm really glad we went away from that but anyway Linda came in and you know Linda's you know uh, uh, French mm -hmm. and uh, just totally not what I'd imagined I mean of course she was beautiful and she read mm -hmm. she, was, she was good she got all the beats she understood the part but it was just like I, she was one of those people like usually I meet someone and I can size them up in a minute like mm -hmm. I have a really good knack for that but her I just like I, there was just something about her I couldn't quite tell where she was coming from like are we gonna get along are we not gonna get along are we gonna be able to work together I had no idea even after the callback right you know so I I was actually like I, I was I was scared casting her I'm, I'm actually really thankful both to Al and uh, Hillary one of the other producers uh, they really pushed me to step outside of my comfort zone and take a chance on her they were like, you know, just, you know, like you're, you're you know, I'm, I have a tendency to like, I like to work with the same people and the same types. And like, I really stepped out of what was comfortable for me and worked with her, took a chance and it, it really paid off. By the way, you just talked about me in the third person. When right, when oh, when you're right here. Me, so, yeah, but you're, but thank you. You're, you're, <laughs> I, I oh. accept, I accept the compliment. Uh, just real quick you know what somebody pointed out the other day and you can see it better in a, a scene later on but with his headphones there and the glasses hanging off there he looks like the kool-aid man <laughs> like it's like the eyes and the mouth i'll, I'll, I'll point it out later because it looks funny. just like it i'd never noticed it until i mean just the other day and we're, we're sitting here like uh you know like a week away from delivering the final product this is, right here. this is ashton blanchard um, I found her doing Trap, uh, the movie that actually inspired this, and uh, uh, she's just great. Like she's she's so naturalistic. Like I, I love I I really like working with her. I like mm -hmm. her as a person. Uh, this character wasn't actually even in the first draft of the script. Um, mm -hmm. We had a we had a scheduling issue with the girl playing uh, Susie, mm -hmm. and we couldn't. Uh, and, and you know that character carried on into the first like thirty minutes of the movie. There were a bunch of lines, and when we had that scheduling thing, I had to basically write in a whole new character. Wow. So I uh, assigned all Susie's lines to her for, like, the next 20 minutes and created the script supervisor character, which turned out to be one of my favorite characters. Well, it was actually um, this whole thing going on between her and the 
the boom man is, is kind of interesting in the sense that one is much older than the other two. You know, oh, yeah. And, and people have commented about what's with the with the old guy and the young girl. I says, oh, I'm glad you noticed. I, I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know, <laughs> I wouldn't know nothing about that. <laughs> glad you noticed. This. And then, but, uh, uh, these two are, are uh, interesting also. How did you run across these two actors right here? Well, I actually... Paul, Paul and Gladys. Paul and Gladys, yeah. Gladys, um, she acted in a project Blaine was working on. He was working on a, a short, and uh, she was actually a last-minute replacement for a girl, and she was playing a, uh, a Mexican national. She was pregnant, uh, couldn't speak any English, and uh, one of the main characters in that had shot her, like, in the mm -hmm. baby. Mm -hmm. And I, so I'm sitting here watching Gladys, and she's doing this scene, and she's just, you know, she's shot. She's just giving it everything, like, going all out, like, just, like, incredible. And uh, the the other two actors in the scene are just they were giving her I mean nothing they were they were blank slates mm. and I, I was just so impressed with her ability to stay in the moment like in spite of you getting know, nothing getting nothing yeah. you know and, or getting less than nothing I mean it, to me it would have took taken away right you know but she's you know she stayed in it and I was like man I had and she was really cool. I was like, I had to find something for her, and actually, that character wasn't in the original script either. I, I wrote that uh, that part in, and then uh, you know, uh, her, and then she introduced me to Paul. They're actually a, a real life couple, mm -hmm. and uh, he was just getting into acting, and I was like, oh, okay, I'll meet him. And but <laughs> he, he came in and read, and I was like, oh, my, he just he was Very perfect. He was, yeah, he was natural. He's perfect for it, and he actually like, he has a lot of charisma. He sensed it a. Uh, a uh, web series, like a, a pilot for a web series, mm -hmm. and he was the lead character in it. He's he was yeah. Really I didn't good. I didn't know he was not an actor. So yeah. he, he was he very was, good. Yeah, he started out yeah. as a musician. I think I think uh -huh. he was a in, a in a a fairly popular regional band. I have no idea what the name is. The girl playing the makeup girl here that, that that's Anne Marie Pasmino, right? Right. You, you've worked with her before. Yeah, yeah, she was. She's also been in just about every movie. I've, well, in every movie I've done since I've been in California. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I, I met her on Edges of Darkness, and then she was in Trap. She did a small role and put a ring on it. I, I, I put her in everything. And that's Alonzo, Alonzo Jones. He was also in Edges of Darkness. I met him. I was DPing a movie called Sunday School, mm -hmm. which is just awesome. And uh, anyway, I, I wrote the part in Edges of Darkness for him. And then uh, he actually, it's kind of funny, he wasn't, we, I brought him on to be my AD, but like I typically on a movie like this, the crews are so small, I, I hardly, I don't really use an AD much. I, I tend to be my own. Uh, I brought Alonzo on, honestly, just in case, because none of us had ever worked with Glenn, and here was this actor used to working on big movies, and we are like, is, maybe he'll, he won't show up, or maybe he'll show up and see how little the movie is, and be like, oh, see you guys later. This, yeah. yeah. So I, I brought Alonzo there kind of as a backup if we needed a, that character. And then I had to write something for him, so I did that scene. In reality, we had a very, I don't even think we'd call it a skeleton, skeleton crew. No. We had more actors on the set. More than actors crew than members. crew, yeah. yeah. I mean, when we got to Big Bear the second time, it was pretty much me and you. I mean, you know, makeup, of course, uh -huh. and effects and everything, but as far as, like, you know, grip, crew, camera, like, that was it. Well, that's one of the things, uh, I think, that filmmakers, <clears throat> if they have a vision and it's something they want to do, um, sometimes it is just you. You know, you think in terms of, how do I get this done? Yeah. And in, in essence, uh, we did accomplish something with two or three of us, but a lot of people say you, you need 20 or 30 people to do this. Right. And it's not necessarily true at yeah. all. Yeah, I mean, if uh, this is testament to it, to be to be honest with you, yeah. <clears throat> and I I think this movie, I mean, from a just even from a script standpoint, I was already thinking about the budget, you know the you know keeping the first twenty minutes from the behind the scenes perspective, kind of found footage, and you know, uh, uh, keeping the uh, the the scope of it. While it still has a little bit uh, bigger scope than what your typical uh, low budget flick does. Like I still was keeping everything within reason. And that's uh, Michael Morrison over there on the right. Uh, I'd actually, uh, I'd, he uh, 
did a lot of our extra like PA and grip stuff throughout the shoot. And yeah. You know what? And this is me and uh, Anna Marie. And uh, I actually, I you know, I you know have no ambition to be an actor or anything like that. It's just I, it was totally a practical decision. We were paying all the actors, and it's like, okay, here's a character I won't have to pay for. And I knew I was physically gonna operate the camera, so it just made more sense for me to do it. But this was one of those uh, instances where I'm here doing this scene with her, and you know she's such a good actress, and I was like, this is really fun, you know. <laughs> like I mean, I mean, I'm not run, gonna run out and put myself in my next movie or nothing, but yeah. that was it was really like I really enjoyed doing this. This and uh, there's a scene later with Linda that was really fun, and then and you know for even how uncomfortable it was, I really liked doing my death scene as well. Well, you can understand then why why Spike Lee, Quentin Tarantino, these they like to put themselves in their movies. Yeah, it's uh, fun. In some movies. Yeah, I mean, I would, uh, I, 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 definitely, I would never want to be a lead character. I yeah. would not, I, not even a major supporting character. But you know, like coming in and doing a thing for a minute and then getting out, it's, I mean, it's fun. Like the, I mean, like this, this was a hellacious day. Everything around this, but then doing this scene, like this was fun. Yeah. Yes, yeah, they say uh, as, as you we're about to see here, uh, it's it's a it's a love scene with you in the lead, and I guess it's always hard to kiss a pretty girl, you know. I, I was you know. torture. <laughs> it was torture. And this uh, uh, this is actually this is like one of the this this scene is one of the only scenes where the audio didn't come out, which wasn't our excellent sound mixer's fault because he wasn't there. It was my fault for not scheduling him. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, I had a mic down there by me, but it just, it sounded horrible. We ended up having to ADR this whole scene. And actually, I was supposed to die at the end of this scene. Um, well, actually, this scene was supposed to come later in the found footage. Right. And uh, I ended up for pacing, moving it, and creating a new death scene for the cameraman. Now, I think at this part of the movie... Um, we're starting to realize that this young lady's up to something here. Uh, yeah, From a, M more more to her than meets the eye. Yeah, she's uh, here. She claims her love for her her stuntman uh, boyfriend Bert, who's who's left and told him to go. And now we find her horsing around. So. Uh, yeah, Linda, is, Linda, of course, you know, kind of exudes that anyway. Um, she's just that pretty. But <laughs> the the thing the thing that was really cool about Linda, hmm. um, just in her acting style, is uh, like Linda w never will she'll never do the same thing twice. Uh -huh. Like she, I, I mean, unless you ask her to. Right. I mean, she'll totally give you something completely different, and especially. Um, like we have, you know, other actors that have a, you know, a different approach and they have, you know, what they're, they're going to do and they have it planned out and she comes in there and just kind of like throws you off a little bit, keeps you on your toes, mm -hmm. keeps things a little more in the moment. And I like that was really great, especially in this uh, ensemble setting. It was, it was, we were really lucky the way uh, the ensemble aspect mm -hmm. of it came together is that uh, when you're doing again, something so, you know, low budget, we didn't have time or money for the rounds and rounds and rounds of auditions. Right. We everybody was pretty much auditioned alone, you know, single. And they're like, okay, well, this person by themselves, they were great. But literally, like when I called action on the first day, I had no idea, you know, other than intuition, you know, whether these people were actually going to click, you know, and it, they just did. And they like, you know, like Alonzo and Anne Marie, they had worked together on edges, so they had some history, but like, you can feel it just like in that little moment there, like mm -hmm. that, like the, and that was a little improv bit, but this is actually right here. It's my favorite little bit of acting in the movie. I, I love this speech and she just delivers it so well. And I love her hair extensions. <laughs> this is, uh, this is also, I mean, for, for being such a, you know, a low budget movie, mm -hmm. um, this, like there were aspects of this that it felt like my first real, like big, big budget experience. I mean, we actually, we had, you know, we owned the locations and, you know, by owned, I mean, you know, we were insured, we had mm -hmm. permits. I wasn't worrying, you know, I wasn't looking over my shoulder for cops ready to run, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, all the actors were paid, you know, the crew that was there was paid. Mm -hmm. I mean, we uh we we shot on you know different locations you know over the course of you know we shot the movie in chunks over the course of weeks three three, three yeah, four weeks three, four weeks yeah. and you know just 
uh, you know, we had we had actual reshoots. I'd never I I've never ever shot a low budget feature or I've went back and reshot something. Not because I didn't want to, because I never I just couldn't had the opportunity. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, we there there was a a few instances here where we had to go back and get this or that and. Well, earlier we had mentioned the the size of the crew, and I think maybe uh, we should tell people really what we were dealing with. When when you're looking at this movie and you're seeing all these actors wearing all this wardrobe, uh, you know, props, prop, makeup. If you, if you think about it, in reality, we didn't have a wardrobe person. Yeah, no. Okay, we didn't have a script supervisor. For a day or two we did, and then we didn't have one afterwards. Yeah. So the continuity, the wardrobe, uh, we didn't have props. We were all keeping an eye on the props. And as you're watching this movie, first off, you see the amount of actors. There's a guy wearing makeup, a mask in the back, right? Mm -hmm. they're, all wearing diff they're all wearing different wardrobe. Look at all the props they're using. I said, th there's, there's different things going on. And we didn't have specific people to do these things right we had to keep track amongst ourselves and yeah. and the yeah, actors right. who did a fantastic job keeping track of stuff yeah, and you have like a actor like uh claudia for example who mm -hmm. uh she's kind of a producer in her own right she does mm -hmm. her sketch comedy stuff and she like i mean we would come back to a scene you know like a week later and she'd be like you know what i had a smear of blood uh it was two inches it was on my right hand i mean like incredible, you know. Or, or or you look at Lee. He had his uh, glasses and his uh, his headphones, and he mm -hmm. had those to the he. And they were always in the right spot. And you know we had that big jib. I mean we had. I mean we had we had the the executive producer was keeping track of you know Eddie's bloody shirts, you know, or uh, or you know or, uh, Hillary who was our other producer. I mean you know she would have to leave set and you know drive back to get you know whatever a gun mm -hmm. prop or I mean yeah we were told it was, it was tough yeah and there, there was also no gaffer um, no yeah. key grip um, any it, 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 as filmmakers even even in small movies you usually have department heads even if they run it all yeah you have people who take care of it um, we basically had ourselves as filmmakers and like you said there's other filmmakers other people who have some experience that experience helped us a lot, oh, yeah. and the fact that the that they were all readily available as out as actors uh, was uh, you can't pay you could if we had the money I would gladly have paid oh, them yeah. for that. But yeah. but the bottom line is is that when we when people watch this, I'm sure they're thinking, hey, it takes 20, 30, 40 people to make these things, and we didn't have that. We had mm -hmm. ten max. Yeah, ten. I mean, you know. in, in the background, through a lot of the found footage stuff, for example, uh, kind of you know, PA grip wise, we had like uh, John McGill, who actually he's in the monster suit through mm -hmm. most of the movie. But you know, so he he would be in the monster suit and he would like take the head off and he would be running around like helping move stuff. Right. You know, and right. then he would put back on the head and then he'd go eat somebody. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. yeah. Or, you know, or Mike Morrison, he's playing the, the script super, I mean, the assistant editor. There, he just pushed Richie. Like, he'll, he'll, you know, run around and help and then, you know, run back around in front of camera and do something, you know. And that was, that was, that was difficult. I mean, pretty much uh, the only people that were just, you know, dedicated to just their job, you know, was, was sound. You know, which I, you know, from the get, like, I, especially on low budget movies, and this is my advice to anyone out there, like, whatever your movie looks like, whatever the cat, spend your money on sound, get a good sound guy. Yeah. Like, I, I mean, I'm not ashamed to say our, you know, our sound guy was paid, was the highest paid member of the crew. Or, or shoot, he got more than me. I didn't get, I didn't get anything. <laughs> he, he but got, he got <laughs> more than a lot of people. But I'm just but, saying, but I'm just saying, it's, you know, it's worth you're it. You're right. No, Ben um, was a fine. Yeah. Ben was one of those things And where he's still working for less than what he should. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the, the kid was really, really good. And he was uh, always on and thinking ahead. Yeah. Again, we didn't have the crew. We didn't have an AD telling him what's up next. Script, so he went and found out what's next. What are we doing, you guys? And he was always communicating. Yeah. I says, it's hard to find people like that. It really is. And just the quality of his work is good. Now in this scene here, I know I know you had a tough time with it because of time, uh, Glenn Plummer was getting ready to leave. Oh, uh, yeah. Almost, it was one of those scenes of what could go wrong did go wrong for you. 
but yet you stuck in there and you made the scene work. How did you make that scene work with the difficulty of all these actors? Okay, you must have ten actors in this scene. Yeah, and with an actor getting ready to leave within half an hour or ten, you know, whatever time you had, how how did you finally discover it to well, shoot it the way that you did? Well, I mean, the the shooting style of it was, I mean, it was planned out, you know, weeks in advance. I mean, I, I knew exactly the coverage I wanted to get. But um, I, I think the secret, and it has the pressure starts getting on, and you know you you know you're you're running over or, or whatever. I mean the, the trick. The, I mean one of the major tricks is when you say between when you say action and when you say cut, nothing else exists. You know like that 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 time limit it doesn't exist anymore. You know like you have to focus on the. It's like life. You have you know the only moment that we have is right now. Mm -hmm. You know the future hasn't happened. The past is gone. You got to focus on what's here and now. And by doing that and focusing all your attention on the present, you know, I think you can get through moments like that. Right. And, you know, and, and I mean... That was a difficult scene. Yeah, no, it was. Yeah. But, you know, the actors were prepared. You know, we, we didn't have a great, a lot of time for rehearsal, and they were ready to go. Now, obviously, at this point, they can... They're continuing to shoot after the director has, has died. Died. Yeah, I just thought it was funny. As and, uh, it, you had the horror movie, and you know you knew the director was gonna get killed, but I like that he's just killed like incidentally. <laughs> like it's not it's not a monster. He's killed by the jib. And originally, it was supposed to be like uh, I I've seen him on low budget sets. Sometimes they'll tie a cord from like one tree to another, and they'll uh, wait. They'll put a weight, a counterbalance on the bottom of the camera, and they'll like like you know just run it along the line. And it was going to be that and the weight that hit him, but uh, that it, it, it was just easier to use the jib. Well, I just thought that the whole element of the show must go on in, in this part of uh, your storytelling was <laughs> was uh, interesting. With you know, the show must go on. Yeah. Somebody dies, okay. Right. The show's, well, gonna, I, yeah, the show's going on. I, I, have, I mean, I've, you know, like some, I mean, filmmakers, we like we have that mentality. I mean, no matter what happens, I mean, I've, I've been on sets where you know people's like members of their family have passed away, and you know, and they'll 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 finish their day, and then they'll go whatever. Yeah. I mean, and I'm not saying I'm not saying that's what should happen, or but but I've seen it. Right. And I mean, there's that mentality, like no matter what happens, we're gonna we're gonna get this shot. We're gonna, you know. And that was that was kind of a comment on that. Right. That's that was interesting. Yeah. And this is the 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 scene that I added at, at the end to kill off the camera character because he was supposed to die before. And we shot this like really late in the shoot and we actually had to shoot this twice as I had uh, not the stuff with her but the death part of it as I, we had shot it once and the footage didn't come out and we had to shoot it again and I had to put all the blood in my ear the second time although the second time we did it on the little hill and I got that, the fall in there so it worked out better well it's, it's part of your uh, uh, what's the word your dedication to acting. <laughs> Not only did you get to kiss the pretty girl in the movie, but you got to kiss the ground with blood all over yourself. So uh, you, you took you took two for the movie, basically. Yeah. 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 This was this was fun. I actually had a lot of fun doing the doing the dive and the the death. The, the only thing that sucked was holding your breath. But. And it was really hot, if I remember. It was right. really hot. It was really yeah. hot. When we shot, uh, when we shot the uh, the scenes at the beginning with Jackie, um, it was uh, in September in Malibu, and it had this horrible like rainstorm, mm -hmm. and it was I mean it was pouring rain everywhere. We were like, oh my god, we 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 just thought we were screwed, and we were like, oh we're gonna go out anyway and just hope maybe we can get it in pockets or you know we shoot for five minutes and or shoot under umbrellas. And uh, we we get out there, and it was amazing. It was like just like a little tiny open pocket of sunshine around the Gore Hills and around in Malibu where we were shooting, and everywhere else was pouring rain. People are still there, like you did not shoot that day. I'm like, yeah, we were shooting. It's like it never rained. We never rained. It was the ground was wet, but it never never rained. Well, it's the same with our cave, which is made out of paper. Oh yeah, and the cave, and, and we were and shooting cave stuff, and we thought the cave was gonna fall mm -hmm. apart, and it didn't. It, it held together. 
That was, that was amazing. Th this was actually the hardest uh, shot of the movie. When I, uh, I, hadn't re I hadn't really realized in production I was going to do the thing with the camera messing up and I was going to be able to splice together takes, so I was still trying to get everything just in one take, and I think we did this like maybe 12 times uh, before we got it because I had to get one all the way through that, that worked. Mm-hmm. Now in the final product, it's the product at two takes because then I realized I was going to do the camera futzes, and, but the on produ in production this was this was tough. There's our Star Trek earthquake. It's like the original Star Trek where they shake the camera. No, they did they well just, though. Yeah, I was no, no, that, yeah. That it's all about timing, you know. Uh, obviously the trees and the rocks and things, but people aren't watching; they're watching actors. And yeah. if actors carry it off, it's it's very believable. I, I thought they did a great job. Good timing on that with them. And this is uh, was this, this the was this the first days of shooting? Was was this, the, the, this we was, came back and did this? this yeah. No, no, no. This is Mao. This was the this was the first it trip. The, the first trip to Big Bear. Um, what actually happened? We'd originally only planned one trip to Big Bear. Um, our, one of our uh, other producers, uh, Bravo, he was doing the effects himself we were going to do it much cheaper the budget of the movie was a little less um we got out here on this day ready to shoot the monsters and they just did not look right yeah. and uh we decided based on the strength of the footage that we got like we got some good stuff let's take a pause let's come back in a week or two and let's you know hire an effects company mm -hmm. and get better monsters and we did this is actually one of the only shots there's two shots in the movie with the original uh monster design one of them's coming up right here at the end of this. You see him just for briefly, like, cross frame. You can't really... That was him. Yeah. And then uh, later in the movie when it attacks uh, uh, Lee Perkins, um, you can see his head there for a mm -hmm. second. Other than that, it was all the 1313 creatures. And now we're into the, like, uh, regular movie section of it. And that is one thing I wanted to ask you. Um, what... When did it come to mind that you wanted to do a hybrid movie, not not a found footage movie, not a, a regular uh, narrative? What, what what came across that you wanted to do it like this? Well, I mean, in, in most every movie that I've done, like I like I, I like to attack stuff in a non traditional manner. You know, like Edges of Darkness, I did an anthology movie where the anthology was intercut. You know, and people point to Trick or Treat now, but I did it way before that. Yeah. You know, it was like, I, I, and I thought, you know, it was just, it was interesting. You know, what, whether or not, you know, it, it, you know it, sometimes these risks work, sometimes they don't. But mm -hmm. like as a filmmaker, as a writer, as an artist, like I like, you know, like taking risks. And uh, I, I really... Um, I knew that I wanted to do something different structurally with this from the beginning. Mm -hmm. I knew that I wanted to have, you know, my first act and my second acts running parallel and then coming together to continue on into a third act. Right. Um, and then it was when, you know, when I had made the decision to make it, you know, the film crew and, you know, make the comment on, you know, the meta comment on Trap and all of that, I, um, I, I thought that the most interesting way, because, like, first acts to a lot of movies, especially horror movies, like bug me so much you know because it's you know you're getting to know the characters and it's like these getting to know you scenes and i i thought like a, a really interesting way and almost the perfect getting to know you scene is an interview mm -hmm. you know which uh, you know like a behind the scenes interview and i was like so why don't i do the whole first act from the perspective of the behind the scenes crew and i wasn't really even thinking of it as a found footage thing which is you know what it you know, it, you know what, certainly what it's going to be seen as but you know that, that wasn't the intention I see. Now here is um, Claudia. Yeah, Correa, Claudia. Who's playing? Now what these characters um, are? The angels. Yeah. 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 Well, I, I actually I have a script called uh, Feud that it's a, a really larger budget thing that I've been trying to get made for years, mm -hmm. and uh, the angels in that are the, the these are the same kind of angels. You know that they're you know they are angels. They come down. They take human shells and they you know use the human shells to you know carry out you know God's work on Earth. Mm -hmm. you know? So that yeah, that's them. And my, when it, whenever it comes to like supernatural stuff, I I mean I and I like supernatural movies. I like the ghosty and special powers and all that. But 
for me, I wanted to, I like I like more physical based things. So you know, I didn't want them, you know, with powers or you know rays yeah, and that's... you know telekinetics and all of that. Like I wanted them, you know, as physical beings. You know, so that that's. Well, it, it actually makes them more interesting, and, and for us as human, to follow you know what they're doing, which which you'll see as as people get into the movie, they actually deal with the fact that they're they have human emotion. Oh yeah, you and know. and having been in human shell for however long, and you know coming to Earth however many times, they actually they have a history and a past, mm -hmm. and you know a romantic past as it turns out. Right. And and I like going into that, and then of course when it just when it looks like you know you're going somewhere with that, you pull the rug pull out the rug of them and out. kill yeah. one of them, and then and then move on. And here's yeah. our here's our first cave shot. Yeah. For the filmmakers now. Tell us a little bit about the cave. I, honestly, I don't know too much about it. I, I went out there, and Blaine had built the shell of it with, uh, I, I don't even know what they're called. They're big metal steel like poles that you can bend. Rebar. Rebar. Like rebar. And uh, he had made a shell out of that, and I think chicken wire. Chicken wire. And then yeah. they put, uh, it, I think it was basically construction paper all over the inside, different, wow. different types of construction paper, uh -huh. and then they spray painted it and spackled it and... Like, they actually tried a couple of different methods before they decided on the construction one. paper. Like, mm -hmm. at one point, I think they were trying burlap, and they were they were trying to uh, paste something over the burlap, and it just, they kept pulling the whole shell down. And uh, they ended up doing, uh, coming up with this. It's pretty ingenious, actually. Yeah, no, I mean... Uh, again, we're, we're dealing with, with an extremely low-budget movie here. Yeah, no know? money. And, and you, you hear, I mean, extremely low. I mean, we're talking when, when all is said and done, I mean, uh, d deliverables, insurance, everything. I mean, this movie is done for about $35,000, give or take. Of course, people are going, yeah, right. <laughs> well, you, you know, it is. I mean, that, and that's, I can, and usually when people, when a director or something yells out the budget, you know, especially on low budget stuff, they're talking production budget and, you know, well, we spent this, no, the post, everything. I mean, people grand. spend that on their craft service for right. God's sakes. You yeah. Know? And I mean, you know, and if micro budget crews are able to do stuff like this, like, you, you know, you'll have a, you know, the writer director will, you know, defer their payment or take a very low payment. You know, has a writer, has a, I, I'm an editor as well, so I was able to take on post for almost nothing. I mean, we did, you know, it's, well, that's how you... Well, you know. well, in essence, what you're saying is the, the producer, writer, director, editor, you know, down to post, those are people you have to pay thousands and thousands of dollars to. Yeah, I mean... To, to make, to do these jobs, basically, uh, at, at various levels of experience. I mean, I, I've directed flicks for other people where I was a hired gun, and, you know, I make more money on those. But, you know, you, you do something like this, and, you know, this does well. Like, you know, this is me, and I own this, and, you know, I own a, or a, a good piece of it. And, I mean, you just you have more stake in it. But, you have more to lose. But this is also not one of those pl movies where you've seen people in a room, there's four people in a room, and they've spent $30,000. Right, right. Okay. Yeah. I mean, look at this. It's 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 big. Yeah. And you, and you go, uh, you know, how do you accomplish these things? Again, it's it's having the, the vision for it. It's right. having the experience where, hey, we, let's go shoot here and do. How do we how do we accomplish that? So, um, this is a good example, you know, of 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 how to make something work. This right. cave. And well, it, uh, one thing I want to say too about uh, the low budget movies, and you know, we, you know, we're we're you know throwing out the term thirty, 30 grand. And I've and I've worked on movies before for less budgets for other people, and like they they accomplish that by not paying people, you know, like they accomplish that by you know taking advantage or not paying at all. We, I mean, everyone, like people got paid here. I mean, we 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 had positions that weren't filled. But like, if you were there and you had a, you know, you had a major role, you were a major crew member. Like everyone got paid. It might not have been paid a lot, but they were paid. Yeah. Everyone, you know. Whereas if you know, like on a lot of stuff, I go and you know they pay the cameraman, you know, and that's it. Well, I'm a firm believer though that it, everyone has a vested interest. Whether you've done this is your first movie or your fifth or whatever, you know. And the thing is, is that these people are professionals. They're they're, they're doing this and. 
they should get something for their efforts. As yeah. Far as I'm well, and, and plus, and I, I think, think, and I think it made a difference to their attitude. You it, know? it does. It shows. Well, it shows them. You know, whether whether it's a crew member or an actor, you're willing to pay something. You're able to cough up something, even on something this small. Like they that. Oh, these guys are for real. This is a this is a this is a for real project. Where I, I've worked on others, even even larger budget, where you know the crew, crew members cast, they just don't care. Yeah. You know, because they know that the producers don't care. And this is this is uh, this is all fun yeah, stuff. Yeah, this is uh, when I first uh, cut this scene together, I actually cried. Is that I, I was distraught. I just did not know how to make this work, and I, it, I I didn't quite get the coverage that I wanted to get. The cave, for how great it was, it was I guess it was a little smaller than what I uh-huh. envisioned. So the right. coverage was different and. I, it was originally going to be these like really complicated like dolly like you know pad here and crane here and I but anyway uh, we went we actually went back and did a couple of quick inserts like mm-hmm. those things of the monster chewing on that was Bravo setting in for Kurt Mega and uh, it, it it ended up working really well and actually my Blaine uh, who uh, sat in here with me in editing for a minute and he had a couple ideas there like cutting to Eddie when he's crawling through the tunnel that really made that work. And the, this was uh, this is one of those things in the script where this this was like this really really long like cool action sequence and you know it ended up being a you know five second like walk out of the cave shoot two monsters and go away but you know that's that's part of the trade off you know sure I, I I think as I I think as it was written it was uh, they burst out of the cave last of the Mohican style and you know like take out several monsters it's, it's some something to that effect. Now, oddly enough, I from remembering this shot here with these two, uh-huh. uh huh, which was actually I remember when we first saw this, everyone just laughs at this this scene. Oh right, because they're they're both. Everyone was late this day. Everyone was tired, and everyone, meaning you, me, and I think the sound guy and these two, yeah, were the only ones there doing this scene. From what I remember, yeah, it was. And yet you watch this scene, and they're both so relaxed. Oh yeah, you know that you watch these performances, and that's why it was funny. You know, he just said something right on, and many times you, you tell people just relax, you know, just be yourself, just do what you need to do. Right. And and I gotta tell you, when I saw this, I go, wow. That, I mean, five people did this. Yeah. You know? Well, you know, I in in a way, sometimes I think that might help because like uh-huh. I think on a larger budget, like it might even almost be the opposite where you have so many people Going standing on. around watching yeah. and they're depending on you to deliver, to move on to the next scene. Right. And it's it's not just the director and, you know, the producer standing there. There's, you know, a hundred people, you know, and the, it's a whole a different... A lot of these scenes is, is you and the, and the sound guy. Yeah, like a, this, for example. There There's there's nobody there. It's me and, and this is her, Agora, right? the sound guy. Yeah. Agora, Agora here. Agora Hills, yeah. And then, and then this is Malibu. Yeah. Well, no, no. Oh, this is all Malibu. It's all Malibu. Uh, yeah. Malibu, Agor Hills. Yeah. And I, I really uh, I love Claudia's hair extensions in this. The way every time she whips her hair, the hair extensions. <laughs> the hair would go with her. I want to do a montage like of just her hair. Just the hair flipping? Yeah. 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 It'd be funny. But this is where I was talking about like her comic timing. Like she really like like you know has written you know like that is you know it's fairly dry dry-ish part right. and you know she really found a little something extra uh-huh. in there to play and all of this uh, all everything in the second act has originally conceived anyway this this was none of this was supposed to be handheld um, everything after the after the found footage up to the third act massacre was all supposed to be tripod dolly like very staid it was a you know had a different visual style uh imagined um i mean we got we get into the woods and if you you just there was just there's no way no no time no like money to have the kind of equipment we needed to be able to but it's also one of those examples though that i mean i could have adapting yeah 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 you have to adapt to your surroundings i mean sure i could have just i could have stuck it on a tripod but you know you know, I would have lost a lot of that energy. I, I, I needed some, I needed movement in there. I needed to be able to move with the camera. And if I couldn't have a, uh, a dolly or a jib or a steady cam in there, then I had to do it hand home. Right. 
and it worked out. I, I just it was just envisioned differently. Now this this camera you're using is the Canon seventy. Um, uh huh. Right. Yeah. This which at the time I think this was a year ago, maybe they they were just really coming into uh, independent feature filmmakers just really start to use them. Yeah, you were you were starting to see it in music videos a lot. There were there were other indie productions that had used them that had been out. It, it was it was actually my first time ever using uh-huh. one. Um, I, I liked it a lot. It was a, and uh, we uh, we shot the found footage mostly with a uh, with a smaller JVC. And then uh, blew up the frame size to give it a little bit more of a vid- flat video look, and then all of this stuff with the uh, with the Canon, and you know b- better lenses. And well, the fact of the matter is, you got to walk around with a camera, a still camera. And yeah. You, and make a movie. It's yeah, yeah, that's what it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I I, I remember uh, I forget where we were. I think we were shooting in the cave. Mm-hmm. Maybe it was uh, I can't remember, but Linda walked on set and saw it for the first time and was like, uh, where's, "Where's your camera? Yeah, where's the camera? <laughs> where's, the pa- where's the Panaflex? Right? You know? she, she's like, "What the hell did I get into?" Because <laughs> I mean, we didn't even have gear on it. It was just no. it was just the camera. Just the camera. Like I didn't yeah. have I didn't have a I didn't have the body. You know, it was no steady no. cam rig. It was just the camera in my hand. No, no, no lines running in and out of it. You know, we so we everything. The thing about the Canon and there's no uh, sync sound, so everything's third party sound. Everything is synced in post, which is what they do in filmmaking anyway. That's what they used to. No filmmaking. <laughs> oh, right. film. no, they don't do film. Anymore. Film is is a two two system. Two system. Yeah. But um, that's why when you're doing it, I don't think we even have it. Of course, you don't. People just shoot on video. It's, it's very non-natural to them. But he, here's that we were talking about the cave. Look at how it holds up. Uh, this camera holds up so well, you know, with, with darkness. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, we had really little light. <laughs> that scene always cracks me up. Yeah, that was Blaine's tarantula. <laughs> I really like the. Then, and then you went from complete darkness to being outside here. Yeah, you know? way. The I mean, it, it just holds up so well. You know, it's. it's Amazing to me. I really like the then uh, the wider shots here, the way the foliage came out. Like, I mean, of yeah. course, it is color corrected a little, but it, it looks like it's almost glowing. Uh huh. She did a good job here. Oh, yeah. I like that her. The fact of the matter is, is that this character was going through quite a bit, and she's still stumbling through to get her job done. Right. Know? Yeah, like uh, she almost loses it for a second, takes a second, composes yeah. herself, and goes on and does what. And basically, that's what. This is the moment I was talking about earlier about him, where I think this little moment where he's walking there and he's complaining. Like, I think that's one of the few moments in the movie where that, like, that's actually him. You know, that, that's actually who that is. Right. And then he like gets bring, it together. Yeah. yeah. P- puts the mask back on and goes on and finishes his role. I like what you did with the color in this, by the way. Sometimes it's very. S- saturated with color other times it's desaturated yeah and just just a little bit yeah because i hear you're out in the forest which would be very very green yeah green and it's not and very green no. you know the i mean and the, the cave should be black but it's got some color in the walls yeah you know? so and it's it's, it's, it's still interesting. and it's still not heavily saturated it's one thing that kills me in uh low budget flicks and mm-hmm. I, I think it's one of the biggest mistakes low budget filmmakers make is they go in there and they they try to make it look like a eighty million dollar movie or yeah. a twenty dollar a twenty million dollar movie. I, I had worked on uh, I directed another movie for a producer and you know they wanted it to look like a forty million dollar Tyler Perry flick, and I kept saying it ain't gonna look it's like that. Yeah. And so I mean, you just it's just not, you know. Like, and and I think that you take something like this you desaturate just a little bit it looks it looks more like a like a film like a movie than it would if I would have tried to oversaturate right. and whatever ah a cave yep uh, cave entrance entrance to hell yeah I, I, I remember we had a lot of trouble building that Blaine finally figured it out well I, when I say we I mean he <laughs> <laughs> I th- don't forget I still owe him 20 bucks so give him his credit will you right. I forget what it was it was like rolls of uh, like fiberglass or something wrapped in plastic I can't. it's clever yeah 
But here's what I was talking about this character. Um, right there. He, he, he makes a transition. Oh, yeah. And he, there's things that you look in this guy's eyes. And yeah, you see it in his yeah, eyes. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, he's not acting with his face. It's not his face. No, it's, it's not his expression. It's in his, it's in his eyes. In his eyes. Yeah. yeah. Which makes him quite the nefarious character. Yeah. You know? the, this is the first uh, scene that I've ever done where I've shot it uh, shoot over the course of I think three different locations it happened on like three different days like with weeks in between them like there are bits and pieces I, like you always hear about them on you know larger budget productions but I'd never done anything like this on a on a micro budget I would have shot this all on the same day at the same time or wouldn't have shot it at all but here we got, like, this is from our second trip to Big Bear. The, uh, that's from our first trip to Big Bear. The, a lot of the close-ups of the other guys were pickups in Malibu. Uh, the monsters coming down was a separate thing in Big Bear. I, I mean, then the, I mean, we're talking different, different parts of California. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we only had, uh, actually only had two monsters at that point like all the shots of those four monsters I just had to keep the camera locked down and then I just composited them in as you know they did Looked multiple great. passes yeah. down the mountain Looked fantastic yeah I had I, we'd done that on some horror flick I'd shot for Tom Devlin and I just always remembered that I was like it's such a simple little trick it, it, or it's effective and that's the the only other shot in the movie of the original monster where he's uh, biting into Lee there Again, going back to continuity, um, what you're explaining you know, this is for regular people who don't understand filmmaking. When you're saying you're doing three different locations in three different you know, uh, shooting periods, and the actors still look the same, the actors are still wearing the same clothes, you know, and the locations aren't so disparate looking that they match, that is continuity. Yeah. That's just so you look at that and you go, oh, that looks so different. It doesn't. And that's a difficult thing to pull off even when you have continuity. You yeah. when you have somebody there. So these things that we're seeing right now, but what the actors are wearing, what they're doing, again, there was nobody on set to keep track of that other than ourselves. So, you know, you give them a lot of credit for, for keeping things together. Yeah, a uh, lot of I'll always repeat that because, uh, you know, I've been doing this since 1977. And I've seen bigger budgeted movies make so many more mistakes than if anyone were to sit through this movie a million times to right. count mistakes. Yeah, I mean, they're you there, know. but not, not as many yeah. as some. Yeah. So, you know, that, that goes to show you to give credit to the people who truly focus on doing their jobs, you know? Yeah. I mean, you also... Know, you look, at the, look at this face on this beautiful girl. This is a great scene. And this poor girl, you know, I, I, I sat down with her when they took it off. She was suffering when she had this on. Yeah, I didn't realize but you, how but sensitive. Nobody, but nobody knew. Yeah. Nobody knew because yeah. of her professionalism. And she sat there and she says, I can do this and I want to do this. And she did a fantastic job. You know, this is frightening, actually. Mm -hmm. And then she spent the better part of the day with that on. Yep. Not a complaint. Yeah. Not one. And for people who have never had that on their face before, it's it's a glue that's put underneath, right? Yeah. It goes yeah. on the skin. Yeah. It literally is pulling constantly on your skin. So when you talk or you make an expression, it's like somebody pulling down on your face. Yeah. So, you know, that's that's a that's not easy to do. Nice movement. It's very convincing falling down in a cave that isn't there. <laughs> right. This is a. This is my only. I mean, the, that the shot with her works just fine. And the one with it, they all work okay. But I, the, I really wish we had you know, like more money and time to actually have had uh, you know the hole in the ground dropping down into yeah, a cave, yeah. or the stunt person oh, to pull it off. Oh, need stunts, yeah. Have, yeah. Which you know, it's not possible. But it just that's one of those things. This was funny. I think he was originally gonna spear her. In the script, it was like he bumped into her and then killed her because he, you know, just didn't know who, who it was. was. 
Uh, That's that, a very funny moment, though. Yeah, no, it, it works. It works much better like that. I can't remember if I had taken it out at the script level or, or if we did it on set. I don't remember. <laughs> I'm now, gonna, at this point, this is getting into the absurd, right? Yeah. I mean, uh, he's he's nuts. He's he's losing his mind. Uh, I say, if you're gonna do a movie called Monsters in the Woods, you know, if you're gonna do it, overdo it. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I really like they th then this is why I'm talking about like chemistry with different people and different people had different types of chemistry and like him and Blaine really like they, they clicked and, but then Eddie clicked with Gladys in a cl completely different way right. and with Claudia in a completely different way but you really believe the relationships between the people like they all seem like they have history like they have you know baggage like you know it, it doesn't these scenes don't exist in a vacuum no I I I think it's because they did have a comfort level with each other. Yeah. And a lot of that has to do is with we're all together having to trust what we need to do. Remember, we're up in the woods. Yeah. You know, we didn't know if there was a little wild animal going to come along or or some fool was going to come along and threaten somebody. We didn't know. We, we Wasn't there somebody afraid of bears? <laughs> yeah. I can't remember who it was. But snakes. There were snakes up there, too. I never saw them. So the thing is, is that... Uh, Nobody was afraid here. Everyone was just focusing on doing their, doing their job. Yeah. But I think they were comfortable in that we were all watch, watching each other's backs while we were doing this. So. Now look at all this blood. Yeah. Back to continuity. Okay? Come on. Look at this girl. Now she wasn't, this wasn't done in a day. This was done over days. Well, know, yeah. Two or three different days. Um. Sport and blood poured all over her. And yeah, I actually w would stand uh, off to the side of the camera and throw a bucket of blood on her. And was that stuff made out of? Um, that's uh, chocolate syrup and food color. That's my. I, I think for uh, blood on people, uh, chocolate syrup is the best. I mean, it just has it just has a nice like like thick like textured look. Where like corn syrup is your more uh, traditional blood, mm -hmm. and it works really well for squirting. And, splashing and stuff like that but as far as something that's going to hit someone and stay on them uh, on people I think uh, uh, chocolate serves the best at least I like it as I, I remember uh, when I did my first movie um, uh, <laughs> I forget who it was whether it was me or uh, um, the cinematographer but one of us had the idea to use uh, dish detergent with food coloring for blood because of the consistency because it had that you know thickish consist consistency mm -hmm. and it looked okay but then uh, we got it on somebody's head and it got into their eyes oh no yeah that was it wasn't fun He just walks away. Saunters off. He just killed an angel. <laughs> What's funny about this character that Eddie plays, like you said, he's not the typical macho, I'm the action guy, I've taken the lead, I'm, you know, mm. follow me. You know, he's 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 an actor. Yeah. And and he's a, he's like a spoiled actor. Yeah. And, but yet he keeps trudging along, but he sees some things that just scare the shit out of him. You know. Right. And he's like, oh my god, what are we gonna do with this? You know. I mean, he just uh, I couldn't quite handle the girl with her face ripped off. <laughs> I remember the cave had pretty much fallen apart by that point. We had picked that up like lately. We didn't even have sound at that point. And this was this was a completely different scene in the first script. I mean, it was the exact same scene, but the script supervisor wasn't in it, and she didn't kill herself here. This was not, none of that was there. It was just this really long exposition scene. Like that was just one of those things where adding her just like really made that scene. Uh -huh. That that's probably my favorite moment in the movie. I like their reactions. 
Actually, Gladys's reaction when the gun goes off, that's, like, the most, like, natural, Jump. like, startle I think I've ever, I, I've ever seen in anything that I've done. I was, that was great. I was just kind of gross, but the, the scene here, if you can see it in close up, there are flies buzzing around this. this oh, yeah. Face, which is kind of gross because it's like dead meat, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but at the same time, we were up there. There were another, it was a hundred and something degrees up in Big Bear, a hundred degrees, and there was nothing but gnats yeah. and flies. And again, the kids did not complain. Mm -hmm. It was like and nobody, it, nobody said, "Hey, I can't take this." You know, I mean, it was brutal up there. Yeah, and I mean, and the blood, like we said, it was made out of chocolate. Yeah. So, <laughs> so they were magnets for all kinds of insects, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This happens to be one of my favorite scenes in the movie when he starts reciting it. It's, I guess it doesn't start oh, here. But yeah, it's coming up. Uh, or he does but the he sets reading. up this whole thing here. Yeah, that was something we added fairly late, too. Well, it made a lot of sense because um, he didn't make the deal with the devil and, and yeah. know, to bring them all uh, out of hell. So that's a good choice, actually. Of course, I, I, I just think it's hilarious that she has to tell them like three times why they're there. <laughs> yeah. What is the purpose of what we're trying to do? Right. The, and they all look at her like, uh, okay. Yeah, I mean, it becomes a joke. I mean, yeah. the la I mean, and the the last one, it was just a, it was a script mistake. I you know I was going through oh, my first draft hilarious. and I was I was yeah. looking at it and I was like, oh my god, she just did this speech like twice in a row and I was getting ready to delete it. And I was like, oh, wait a minute, why don't I just have one of the characters comment on it? And so then I gave Gladys the last line in the scene. And, you know, uh, we, yeah, we got you the first time. <laughs> and it gets one of the biggest laughs. And there's this your, is the scene I was talking yeah, about. It's, like, it's very bizarre. This one, of course, and when he's counting down the... Yeah, the trying, trying to figure out if he had but killed 12 or this not. This was also... You guys came up with this and improvised this in a sense. You came up with this last second also. Yeah, yeah, this you was know. at the end. And I mean, we had had, you know, Claudia yeah, kind of going over it in exposition. But, you know, I just, I, and, and I wanted to give Blaine a little bit more screen time. Because I, I had already started editing at this point, And yeah. I was realizing how, like, how well he was coming off. I was like, we need some more of him. Yeah. yeah. Well, he, like I said, he, you talk about a character that's coming off as nefarious and, and dark. And now you know why he was dealing in the dark arts. You know, this is the scene. Yeah, yeah, this is the one. <laughs> She's so funny. <laughs> She's a riot. I'm surprised they even fit through there. Oh, well, that was a very small like, and I kept thinking the thing was gonna fall apart. But they made it, and that's uh like. There's three guys in suits, but for ninety percent of it, it's John McGill in that in yeah. that one. John you know? was just a trooper. Because yeah. when we were monster. Yeah. yeah, it was I like he. I I just recently found out how hard it actually was that you know that he was like almost fainting a lot. It's and, hot in those yeah. things. Now, who, mean, did, who designed the darn head? And, and the, who designed it? That was thirteen. Tom Devlin's thirteen came, thirteen yeah. effects. Um, I mean, Bravo had done uh, some sketches of them, yeah. what we kind of wanted them to look like, and then uh, Tom Devlin and his crew kind of ran with it. I yeah. think it was actually Carrie Aris Carrie and uh, Andrea yeah. Wiersma. Wiersma. They uh, they did the they did the lion's share of the work, and they were they were the ones that were on set with us the whole time uh, in Big Bear. And oh, they were up in Malibu some yeah. too. Uh, they they brought the blood cannon. They did all the blood cannon stuff in Malibu and uh, had John because we did a lot of stuff with John there in Malibu. Well, again, getting back to you know when the title of the movie is Monsters in the Woods, uh, it, how do you how do you be effective with so little money to do something? You know. Yeah. And again, the way you cut it, the way you shoot it, how you apply these things, you know, if you can do effects, it it all adds up. Because the bottom line is, is that if you don't have monsters, if you're doing your title, then you have nothing. Yeah. You know, you have nothing in the woods. You know, that's not very scary. Right. 
I, I don't know. I think some movies around the same budget might have tried to like do it with some some like bad CG or something. Like you know, they just would have like cut the shots of them. You know, I, 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 you know, we had a we had you know we knew a, a talented effects artist, and I'd worked with him before. And you know, I think for for the I think our our creatures go well beyond what our budget was. Yeah, I agree. And I think they did a fantastic job. And I just got just like cutting back to Blaine over and over, like doing different stuff. And none of that was, went together from when we shot. You know, the monsters were coming out at the cave opening. I think that woe was from a different, a, t- a completely different scene. It's clever. Yeah. I mean, that's what uh, good editing can do. And I think that uh, y- your skills, you know, from from this from from this standpoint, bleed into your writing and bleed into your directing because you see the movie here. Yeah. In the editing process. You know, you envisioned it when you wrote it, but you don't see it until you put this thing together. Oh, uh, yeah. You know? I mean, I, they, I've, I, I've, I know a bunch of people have said it, and I've read it. Uh, I can't remember where I read it, but they say you make a movie three times, once, you know, in the script, once when you shoot it, once when you edit it. And, uh, you know, having such an active hand in all three, you know, I, like, I've, you know, I've, uh, you know, each, you know, each task informs the other. Mm-hmm. You know, like as I'm writing, I'm thinking about how we're gonna shoot it and how I'm gonna edit it, and you know, it it doesn't it it very rarely comes out exactly how you were going to do it because you know, like I said, things that take on a life of their own. But uh, it, it, it helps. Here's a classic example of mood and <laughs> money. Uh, you gave me a light to hold. Yeah, I'm we didn't even. Yeah, red, we couldn't even clip I'm it up a anywhere. Red light with a with a ten dollar lamp. And it lit this whole thing up right here, and it, but it made them look just as bad as bad can be. You know, right. like they're doing some really bad. That's mood. That's the uh, filmmakers, guerrilla filmmakers understand this. But also, you set it up correctly, like all this here. Yeah. And this is good acting. These these kids are good. You know, they're trusting each other here. Mm-hmm. Um, um, you know, and we didn't do tons of coverage here. We no? just did, uh, I think, two shots. I and mean, what did we do? Three to one, if that. On oh, you're average? talking on average, probably. Yeah. Or, I mean, the way I look at it is, I, I, if, I mean, as long if there's if there's nothing like technically complicated, and if the actors are prepared or doing well, I, you know, I don't, I don't see much reason to go much beyond three takes. Now, if if something's not going right, you know, that's different. Yeah. You know, you're trying to get to something different, or 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 you have the time to maybe explore some different avenues in the scene. That can be fun. Although I think rehearsals really the time to do that. Yeah. Unfortunately, we didn't have a lot of rehearsal on this movie. Actually, no. So well, goes back to time. Yeah, yeah. And, and there was, you know, it was a large cast. It was a large cast. And again, on my on a micro budget feature, you, I mean, that's a big taboo. You wouldn't have a cast this large. You know, that no. mo- most producers actually would have looked at that and the number of cast members and been like, yeah, "You're gonna do that for what?" Nah. You know, but I, I, I mean, I like ensembles, and if the actors are prepared, it just it offers you so many different possibilities. Mm-hmm. I like that two shot of them. The, the that was the first time that those two had actually worked together, and I'm sitting here watching this scene, and I'm like, man, I wish I would, I wish there was more in it for these guys, like together, like the two of them, like. It, it, out out of everybody, like Eddie, really like he clicked with almost everyone individually, yeah. like on screen. Like there's just openness. Yeah, yeah. I guess that's the word. Um, Again, getting back to low budget, uh, no budget for explosives. We're about to blow up this cave, you know. All right. Plus, if we blow up the cave, it's going to be paper. <laughs> the, whole <game's laughs> gonna, the whole cave's going to go up. So, yeah. what do we do? You know, yeah. kind of a cheesy CG explosion. You, you have to be clever, though. You know, and it has to be simple enough that you do it and then you move on. Yeah. You're not, you, you know, so many film cities, giant. You and I talked about it. Mm-hmm. It's a giant explosion. You know, people are going to focus. Oh, look at the giant explosion. You know? Yeah, spectacle over. But I mean. This whole movie, though, was about 
I mean, you know, one of the major themes, and you know, as a filmmaker, and you know, in the movie, is like setting up these like huge expectation, or setting up this expect, not huge, setting up a expectation, mm-hmm. and then subverting that expectation. Mm-hmm. You know, which is you know, what the explosion here does. You know, wow. it's like anticlimactic, but it is it is in a, it's in a funny way, mm-hmm. like it, when it works for the story. You know, whereas you know the explosion would have been, you know, would have been sci-fi Over channel cheesy. Yeah. And again, there's a there's a little bit of uh, repetition here. Like right before Claudia um, got killed, you know, she was like, "And you know, give me five minutes, and five minutes, if I'm not back, light it up." And then she gets killed and drug away. And then he basically takes over her role and says the same give thing, me a minute, yeah. right? And then he yeah. takes off. And uh, a, a lot of the the close-ups here, we actually had to go back and get again. Uh, we we just uh, I had a different kind of close-up. And I, I just wanted something different, so we went back in and got that. And although we had to, we had to ADR the close-up lines. And this was really hard to edit. Like, and if you would just you strip the sound away and watch it, and it's like the the hit, you're just like, oh no. But you know, once you put the sound in and everything, it like it worked fine. The fun thing about movies with sound and music, and you know, we haven't talked about the music yet, but oh uh, yeah, we um. We hear this. We can't hear the music when this what we're doing. But the, the musician, when we talked about it, a composer, and I had to debate that too because it was a matter of money. I mean, what what kind of composer can I find? You no, know, you know, an experienced composer right. that might add to this when there's no money. We're not asking him to be a PA. We're not asking him to do a small role in a movie. Uh, we're asking somebody to come in and fully compose a movie. Yeah. And yet, um, was able to find somebody that you liked, and I'm glad that you did. Because I honestly think he, he, he added, you know, to the movie. Oh, yeah, it took it to a whole other level. It was a, it was a, it was a completely different viewing experience with the, uh, the temp score. So these things we're talking about with the sound and the effects, and the, well, sometimes you don't have a lot of money to do it, at least give it your best effort as a filmmaker. Right. To try to find something that's convincing to an audience. Right. Well, I mean, like the you know? the thing the thing with the the score, for example, it was a little bit different with them production because you know we'd finished the movie was in the can. Mm-hmm. We actually instead of just running out and you know finding someone that was willing to do it, you know, for the money that we had, we took the time to find the very best person that we could find for the money that we had. You know, and we kissed a lot of frogs. Yeah. You know? still got warts all over. Right. Them. Yeah. But, you know, what I'm saying is, you know, we, we took that extra time, you know, like, we, you know, we could, our post-production could have been, you know, four mm-hmm. months shorter, but we, you know. You, we, you've since made another movie since this. Yeah, yeah, I, okay. I, I actually, in the times since uh, we wrapped this and I finished uh, my first edit, uh, shot, edited, and another movie has been released, <laughs> you know, right. I, I mean, you know, the, but that happens, some movies, and, and you know, that movie, I was hired to do it, right. and on the day that they hired me, they had a release date. Like that movie was set. Like it had to be done. It had to be in the can. You know, th- this was different. We did this. You know, we did this on spec. You know, absolutely. Well, this is also one of those things where all these things we talked about in making a movie. Mind you, we could have finished this a long time ago and said, "Hey, it is what it is," and and put it out. But I think since since we read the script and started putting it together, that we are always giving the not only the script but the talent and the capabilities the benefit of the doubt yeah. you know what why why cut it short why give it a short shrift when you don't have to if whatever you can give it within the means that you can give it give right it. within if the it means is, it, within the means if it yeah. isn't about money then do we have another way of, of getting it accomplished right but we were able to make this little gem because we gave it the time you gave it the time to nurture its editing you got some reshoots that you said could work you know the talent was available, which was great. Many times they're not. Mm-mm. You know. Yeah, we got um, lucky over the amount of luck, time we that got we got fortunate yeah. with all kinds of stuff. There's an effect there, like you said, that, that uh, worked. It's yeah, brief, just a, just a simple but to the yeah, point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. Yeah, because we, we couldn't we couldn't have fire in the no, paper cave. It blown, <laughs> the paper cave would have went up along with this house. You know, 
I remember because we had talked for a minute about lighting an actual match and just seeing the actual match. And I mean, Blaine, Blaine was like, you just see his face. I mean, he would have let us do it, but his, his face was like, he was scared. Because he yeah. was like, you know, we just, this is like paint Paper. and flammable material. Paper, yeah. And we had just painted it. It was like fairly fresh. Oh, it would have went up like a bomb, <laughs> yeah. actually. Yeah. You know? So but, we, uh, yeah, we didn't. <laughs> all these things added up. And, I, and again, I said that it was to the benefit of the picture to take its time, the time that it needed to get it to this point because in reality um, we have distribution for this very, very little movie. Right. Which which is, you know, as, as most people will tell you, is a very difficult thing to do even when you have millions of dollars to spend on a movie. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that, again, giving you credit and, and a lot of people that you work with uh, closely, you stuck to it, you made it work, you reworked it, you look at things, you didn't give up, um, and you've put a lot of effort into this. You know, you you personally have put a lot of effort into this movie. I gotta tell you, it shows. It's on screen. All the stuff, regardless of the lack of money and the lack of resources, what you did for a single entity is up there on the screen. Yeah. I don't know what much else you could do to this movie. Yeah. You know. Yeah, not without a lot of money. I just want to talk about the chemistry between these two. Like I want to do the next shot and they're looking at each other. Well, it's funny because you know people talk about well let's put stars in movies all the time, right? Yeah. Right. Well, then picture Jennifer Lopez and uh, uh, <laughs> I can't think of the actor. I was thinking about it the other day. Um, put put a couple of stars there. Yeah. And how much does that change this movie? You know. Oh yeah. Mm, totally different. It, it's a totally different thing. Here's our pr other producer, Hillary. All right. And uh, her friend who came in for a day's worth of work. I really liked him in this little, like in this little tiny role in the little span of like forty five seconds. Like he had a little mini arc. Like, <laughs> I, like I, he he did really well yeah. for this little, like just a couple minutes coming in. All these guys, all these people came prepared, did their work. They were very good. You know? Mm -hmm. The little guy who's oh, a non actor, you yeah. know. Uh, and he came in and did his thing. Yeah. We're in uh, we're actually in Griffith Park there okay. with the with those guys. And back in the monsters and, and monsters Big Bear. Monsters and Big Bear. <laughs> right. Well, that's our that's our little gem. Um the, the, the sequel, we're, we're thinking of doing a Latino version called Vatos in the Woods. Uh, you know, uh, but I think you did a great job, Jason. I congratulate you on the work. It's, it's a truly fantastic little movie. So, okay. I'll be out there and let people play and say what they're going to say.